Welcome back. Welcome back. Once again, we have another story, another journey. Um, Tyler and I actually go back a little ways, uh, several years. In fact, we've met on many different occasions from events that were in Michigan. And then because of Lego, we've met in Milwaukee, where you're from. And we do a whole bunch of different things. And I, I, I wanted to open this because I have this special story that I've actually used in some of my public speaking. And, and I just love the way this emphasize how much you support your wife and your family and how much you all kind of work together. So uh, I'm going to tell that first and then, then we'll jump into the regular part of the program. So um, when we first met out in Ludington, we were at an event with uh, Josh and it was the AGS, the Conquer program at that time. And we had this fun day activity planned and scheduled and you and your wife were coming up and I was helping with the skeet shoot. Uh, component of it. And you guys were talking about how much you duck hunted and how you guys all love to be able to go out and stuff. And um, it, your wife, can I use your name? Maybe I don't know. If yeah, I'm absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, so Shelly actually was um, struggling to be able to hit the targets as they were flying out. And as we were talking, come to find out she was very left eye dominant. And we had right hand guns, but we had her switch shoulders. And the first bird that flew out, she popped that thing. And you were just like so excited because you were watching her and she was successful. And it was just like it was thing. And I, I, I still clearly remember that whole situation and about how much you were proud of her and supported her. And like, I just I, that really, really stuck with me. And I, I really appreciate that about your character and your and I know there's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. But anyway, I wanted to share that because that, that really, really impressed me. All right. Into the real part of our thing <laughs> as we go here. And as we introduce everybody, this is what we do. Say, OK, Tyler. For all those that haven't met you, we meet in an elevator. Give me the 30 second. Who is Tyler? All right. So my name's Tyler Schmoll. Um, I guess in 30 seconds, we could round it up as, I guess I'm more of the human version of Curious George. I kind of dive into things <laughs> without, uh, without really, you know, considering the ramifications, but I have to know what's on the other side. And although, you know, it hurts learning life that way, uh, a lot of the lessons that I've learned have been very memorable because of that. And um, it's also ingrained uh, a sincere sense of grit in my heart. And um, with that grit comes the inspiration to push and lift other people up to do hard things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been blessed enough to have the right people fall into my life at the right time to encourage me when I needed it. And uh, Tim, you are absolutely one of them. Um, and as I've reflected back over the years, I, I can literally just name person after person and the core beliefs that I believe in and why I believe in them because of those people. So mm -hmm. that's me. I, I love that. And there was a friend of mine, Tony Grubmeyer, he said this, that the teacher will show up when the student is ready. Definitely. And it sounds like that's been the case for you and you, you were ready to take that step and ready to go forward. So let's dive into that because I, I know part of this, but I really want to hear it in your own sense of let's first start with what were your core beliefs? That's the word that you used. We used narrative. What was the false narrative or what was the narrative that you that you fell into or believed was going to be about your life? prior to becoming the adult, prior to actually stepping into the roles of responsibility. And again, it could be anything from this is what I was told. This is what was shown to me. It was an example. All of those different pieces and parts that come together. But I'm going to give you the mic and let you talk about what you believed it was going to happen. Sure. So as a child, um, I don't remember a lot of, you know, my childhood. I grew up, my parents got divorced uh, when I was in fourth grade. Um, my stepdad was, uh, you know, verbally and physically abusive. It's something that, you know, I've, I personally learned what, what not to do more frequently than what to do by observing mm -hmm. what was around me. Um, and that gave me a sense of empathy and understanding for people. And I feel that over the years, it's almost led me to a point where I allowed empathy to take too much control in my life. And Ooh. I became a, I would call it for a lack of better words, a gap filler. So, um, you know, when, when things would go awry, I would just be Johnny on the spot. How can I solve the problem? What can we do? What do we, what do we have to do to solve this? And um, when I was in the military, 
there's either guys that, you know, they do a lot of talking or they do a lot of doing. Um, I was trained to be a hydraulic and structural aircraft mechanic and I was a mule. I was a guy out doing work every single day because if something needs to get done, I'm not going to sit around and talk about it. Give me some tools, give me some direction. We'll get it taken care of. Um, but I, I lacked the ability to have, uh, adult conversations with people because I grew up in a volatile situation and that's what I was used to. So if, yeah. um, if something got hard, I just dove into my work rather than diving into the relationship. Man, you touched on man, a couple of different key elements in there, <laughs> which, which I, I hope we have a, enough time to be able to even actually develop or even talk about. All right. So let, let me just recap what you said there. First of all, is the fact that because of extreme circumstances and you said of the the abuse aspect but i'll use the word extreme circumstances it put an immense amount of trauma and i've seen this happen in many people's lives where the trauma creates a deep empathy within somebody because they can feel and they have to sense the situation very quickly but then you use the word that i have not heard before this is the first time is you said i became a gap filler so can you kind of can you expound on that a little bit as far as what that exactly means? And then you use the military about doing and saying and like, what does that mean? Did you take on responsibility that wasn't supposed to be yours? Did you take on the feelings? Did you take on what what was it that how did you fill gaps and why? Why? Why are you saying it's a negative thing instead of a positive thing? All the above. Um, you can only pour from a cup that's being refilled and replenished on a regular basis. Um, I will say the one good thing that came out of my childhood was uh, my parents put me through through parochial school. And um, although I didn't really understand it at the time, um, the the faith aspect was always there. So ha, that's not fun. Uh, <laughs> um, but the faith was always there. So I never really questioned, you know, how am I going to get through this? Or how, you know, there was never any doubt in my mind that I would make it through to the next day. I just knew that things were really hard. And the only choice you have is to get off your butt and do the thing. Um, and if people were uncomfortable doing uncomfortable things, then I guess I'll be that guy that does the uncomfortable thing. So if it means working long, hard hours, then I'll do that. If it means taking the crappiest job, and there's a story for literally the crappiest job in the military, but we will pass that up. Um, I was put in janitorial duties. I'm not going to pass it up. So <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Let's we tackle were, it. Uh, when I first got to my, uh, my first command, even though I got trained to be an aircraft mechanic, you know, they put you through, you know, you got to work your way up from the bottom. So we got put in janitorial duties. So um, there was a certain circumstance where somebody had the most explosive experience in one of the bathroom stalls and nobody, nobody wanted to do it. Myself and three other guys were tasked with the job and everybody else just stood there, you know, looking as it was gross. So I literally had the crappiest job of all time. I, it was gross, but you know what it, when you're, when you're in shit, what are you going to do? Just clean it up. So, that's, that's what I do. I, I solve problems and, you know, I, I do hard things because you, you get stronger every time that you challenge yourself. And, um, yeah. So doing hard things and challenging yourself, but at what point is that causing, cause you mentioned earlier there just briefly, but you mentioned it, you can't serve out of a empty cup. So doing uh, hard things and, and doing all of that, at what point is it breaking? What to, at what point is it toxic? At what point is it negative? Absolutely. So where, so when I got out of the military, I started um, a landscaping company. So we did lawn care, snow removal. Um, my dad, when I was a kid, he had a roofing company. He did snow plowing in the winter. And um, he instilled the joy of driving in my heart and whether it be, you know, driving a tractor towing aircraft or driving a car down the freeway or operating an ATV or a snowplow, um, just that connection with you and a piece of equipment and having that mindfulness of doing the thing um, has always brought joy to me. So when um, 
when I had the opportunity to get into snow removal, um, it, it just fit like a glove and I, it's, it's a real hard glove for me to take off. So, so, but what, at what point does that, because again, we talked briefly about the, the false narrative aspect of this and the fact that, you know, you can't serve out of an empty cup, but how, uh, maybe this is part of the transition. Maybe this is part of the wake-up call that you had. But how do you know? You talk about good things. Having empathy, that's a positive thing. Being a, somebody that gets things done and stepping up, that's a positive thing. Taking responsibility, being a gap filler, that's all a good thing. How has that turned toxic? Or when did that turn toxic? And when did that, that turn into something like, dude, I can't, I can't do this much. I can't take this much responsibility. Where's that line? What, what do we look at? So... As I grew the business, um, I enjoyed what I did, but with an excess of amount of empathy and a lack of boundaries, um, I found myself carrying more weight than necessary, um, which over the years I was conditioned to, um, because whatever you put in front of me, I'll take care of. But really the transition point for me was once Shelly and I had kids, um, I got to the point where I had to choose between my children at home or, you know, the team and I couldn't do either. I fell into, I guess you could call a freeze state and I didn't know how to make decisions. I didn't know how to set boundaries anymore because I was so worried about hurting other people's feelings and speaking up about uh, things that needed to be addressed. But I just fear overcame me with, okay, well, what if, what if, what if, you know, I do speak up and we've got a really heavy workload and these people leave at the, at the wrong time or, you know, all of the little things, if you've been in business long enough, there's, there's a whirlwind of negative thoughts that can spin through your head in any given moment. What if we don't get a check-in? What if I can't clear payroll? What if, what if, what if, um, and the what ifs consumed me. And, um, once your energy shifts, the people around you see it. And, um, if you lose faith in yourself, the people around you are going to lose faith in you too. And, um, I lost face in my, in myself. I didn't know how to manage, you know, 20 plus people and manage, um, you know, the hard things that were going on at home. Uh, I want to say in 2019 into 2020, I went about three, three and a half, four months averaging about eight hours of sleep a week. Um, I was out plowing snow. I was fixing trucks when I got back. Shelly made dinner while she was taking care of the kids. I would come in, stuff my face, get back out in the shop, continue working, fixing things, doing paperwork, invoicing, communicating with clients. Everything got done. You know, invoices got paid, all that fun stuff. But by the time that season was over, I was so burnt out because I was doing it all. And I had such a hard time asking for help because I felt I couldn't rely on people anymore. Um, and once I got to that point, it just, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, yeah, that's a tough point to be at. It really was. And once you have the ball rolling with the business that big, it's really difficult to just shut it off. And when you do shut it off, you lose your sense of who you are because you were so consumed with doing what you were doing. And, you know, I'm leading people, I'm, I'm inspiring people, I'm guiding people, I'm serving customers, all these different things. But I saw, I saw the difficult time that when my wife was having at home and I was like, no, I'm done. You know, I, I started this business so that I could have the freedom to be able to spend time with my family and, you know, really be involved in my kids' lives. And once the light clicked, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And it took, it took probably two and a half, three years for me to unpack all of the stress and overwhelm that I went through and, um, let go of 
the guilt and shame for failing because growing up, even though I was curious, George, just bouncing through life, you know, I always figured out a way. And this time I didn't, I didn't understand why I couldn't continue pushing on with the business and still be there for my family. Hmm. So I didn't feel bad pumping the brakes and focusing on my family, focusing on my relationship with Shelly and, you know, reconnecting with the kids. Um, I think one of the things that really broke me was when I walked through the door and the kid, the kids literally just walked right past me. Like I wasn't even there. And I was like, no, this isn't what I signed up for. So from there, um, I focused on, yeah, I focused on my family. I focused on, um, myself because like I said, you can't, you can't pour from a cup that isn't full. And at that point, my, my cup wasn't full anymore. So, um, at that point I reached out to you and you suggested reading a book called fathered by God. It spoke to me and, um, as much as I was reluctant to lean back into um, religion, because at that point I was really struggling with what I was going through as a child, um, things just happened to flow. You know, I read that book, I got introduced to um, Destroying Excuses through you with um, uh, Tony Grebmeyer, and from there on, it has just been okay how can I find gratitude? Because you can either choose, do I want to have gratitude in my life or do I want to be a victim? And do I want to sit in victimhood or do I want to be grateful for what I have and get back into this mindset of just keep going. So there's, you can slow down and you can rest, but quitting just isn't an option. So it took me a long time to gain the rest that I needed. And you know, over the last year, I've found myself, I've found God, I've found peace and gratitude, all the good things. And um, I'm really excited for the growth that I'm going to be going through this year. So it's it's good stuff. So uh, there, there's a couple of different questions I want to ask, and we'll go in a couple of different directions. But what was going on in your brain when you realized you had to make the change? How did you... I don't want to say balance, but it, that, that's kind of the word that's coming into my head. How do you balance the emotional impact of I've lived this way with these beliefs that I can do and I can conquer and I can always take care of it. And then you basically are face to face with the reality of that. I can't do it on my own. And that, that is like, can, can you kind of walk us through something, the, the mental challenges possibly in the, the way that you were able to either forgive yourself or categorize. Like, I, I don't know the words that I'm trying to express there, but I, I'm trusting that you know kind of where we're at. Yes. So um, I have to say, and it's interesting because as you bring these things up, like certain memories just pop into my mind. Um, so above and beyond doing, you know, lawn care, landscaping, snow removal, that kind of stuff. I want to say about eight years ago, we invested in a window cleaning company. So we also did exterior cleaning, window cleaning, all that fun stuff. And... Um, when I slow down the business from, you know, somewhere between a dozen employees during the summer and 20 employees during the winter, I went from that cold turkey down to, I'm just going to work by myself, maybe one guy here or there. Um, and I'm going to do the bare minimum as far as making money goes. And I'm just going to focus on myself and my family. And that's what I did. And it worked out all right for a while. Um, and it gave me the solitude that I needed to be able to slow down and process my thoughts. I was able to just put my earbuds in and listen to some, some good audio books and fill my mind with the things that I needed to fill them with. But one of the clients that I worked for, they had, um, they had a, a sign on their wall and it, you know, spoke, um, spoke about, you know, God, give me the strength to uh, discern, you know, between the things that, uh, I can control and the things that I can't, um, I don't remember the exact phrase. Um, but, uh, basically knowing the difference between controlling what I can control, which is me 
and just allowing everything else to be. And that really spoke to me. So I focused on taking care of me, controlling myself and just allowing other people to be who they are, because we're all going through our own journey in life. Um, we all have our own narrative and, um, our experiences shape who we are and how we respond to, to life. And, you know, once I realized that instead of fighting and trying to control everybody else's response to what's going around on around us, I decided, okay, how can I, you know, if I were in this situation and I were the other person, how would I want to be met? And, you read the Bible and it show up with love. So if somebody's, you know, angry and upset, it's super hard to show up with love. Sometimes <laughs> it's difficult, but, um, the interesting thing is, is that once you set aside your feelings and you know, how somebody's response, it's not even them talking, it's their past talking. Mm. Um, once you set aside your response or your, your reaction to that, you realize that the way that you respond in that moment can be such a pivotal point for them to grow as well. So I guess the, the narrative that I had to change was how can I be slow to react, slow to anger and just be quick to observe and understand. Because if I understand the situation before I react, I can meet those people with love and empathy in the right way so that I'm not controlling them, but I'm guiding them to understand that they're in a safe place. And when you're in a safe place, that's where you grow. Mm. Can you polarize that for us? In other words, say this is how because you you you've done the work and I can hear it in the, the way that you're talking about the when we first started talking about the empathy and the gap filler and the fact that you just give everything and do all of it and now you're talking more along the lines of understanding that they're talking from their past and they're you want to reach out with love and empathy. So can you polarize that for us? Can you summarize just so we can see the the extreme sides of basically what you thought was the the way you were going to live versus where you're at now? So growing up, I thought that I had to control everything. I had to control myself. I had to guide people to what they, I had to tell people what they needed to do because they didn't understand. And rather than telling people what to do, I had to slow down and be able to observe where they're at and meet them with love and empathy and understanding just like I was before, but instead of reacting, I was responding. Mm. That's powerful. I just, just that one simple thing of the difference between reaction and response, you know, and just being planned. That's, that's just incredible. Um, so let's kind of look at maybe uh, part of how you're writing your narrative, crafting your narrative that you've already alluded to several different key elements of, how important your family is and how important your faith is. And then you've got, I know a couple of different businesses. And in fact, I I've even seen lately, you know, more of the drifting type stuff that you kind of getting involved with. I, I'm sure that was never a part of it back when you're working and only sleeping eight hours a week. I'm sure you weren't doing that. So there's obviously been some incorporation of some hobbies. There's been a reprioritization of what you're doing. So can you kind of walk us through both the discovery and now basically the plan of how you are writing that narrative? So by focusing on myself, I had to, I think drifting really came at a, a, a pivotal, pivot, pivotal, <laughs> oh my goodness, three times, pivotal, oh my goodness, it came at the perfect point in time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, so, you know, I went through a, a lot of anxiety and depression, you know, dealing with, you know, the downfall of the business and, you know, me accepting my failure as a father and a husband. And um, can I pause you there? 
I think this is sure. a really important part, and I, I, I don't want you to lose your train of thought, but this is absolutely critical. And I'll ask it, but I think I know the answer. Did that depression, anxiety come into account because your identity was wrapped up in the business of the who you thought you were going to be? I would say absolutely. I mean, I, I'm the kind of person where I have a hard time lifting my head. So if I have an idea that's stuck in my brain, I have a difficult time letting go. And I don't stop until I feel as though I succeed. Nobody told me that entrepreneurship is, <laughs> it is a lifelong journey and it's not a race, it's a marathon. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I absolutely got wrapped up in it. And, um, you know, I, I grew the business to a certain point where I was like, all right, we're so close to breaking a million dollars in gross. I just really want to get there. Why? Because I heard other people talking about, oh, we're, you know, we're making big goals. We're doing big things. And I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to keep up. Let's rock and roll. We're going to do it too. And, um, you know, that's when I started to lose control and just spin my wheels a little bit. Mm. So to tie that back into drifting, um, drifting came at the right time because I had a passion for driving. Um, and drifting was a way for me to take all of my pent up energy and focus it in such a mindful way where none of the other stress that I had to deal with mattered. I'm coming into entry going 70 miles an hour. I dump the clutch, huck the car, and I'm riding the edge of the track. There's nothing else in the world aside from running the perfect line and pushing the car to the edge. By the time I've made it done with that lap, and it's maybe 45 seconds, 30 seconds, um, any stress that I had was gone. And then I'd get right back in line and I'd do it again. Okay, how can I perfect this? And it was something that I could challenge myself to do that wasn't work. And then challenging myself became fun again. And that's, I like, I like when you're able to keep it fun. Because once you challenge, you put yourself in a situation where you challenge yourself and it's just a dig just to dig. I lost my juice. I, there was no, there was no passion for it anymore. Mm -hmm. And, um, the cool thing about the drift community is everybody's there to support each other. You know, it's, you can start grassroots, you get a crappy car and, um, you know, everybody's there. Hey man, I broke something. Do you have an extra part laying around? Yeah, here, I got some tools. Let's get you back on the track. It's such a wholesome environment where there's, Old guys like me, I'm creeping up to 40. I'm driving right next to guys that are 18 years old. And, you know, I'm at this point in my life where I'm starting to speak my truth and I'm I'm comfortable sharing things that I didn't really feel comfortable sharing before. I was, I'm becoming vulnerable with um, some of the difficulties that I've gone through and I'm impacting these young guys. And then I get that little sense of fulfillment. I'm like, okay, cool. So, um, when the business failed, I was like, man, I, I'm really anxious about starting over from scratch. And I, I'm aware of, you know, a disconnect from older generations and younger generations where the perspective is different. Um, you know, older guys that have grown up, um, you know, going through, you know, say World War II or going through Vietnam or going through the Depression, um, they speak in a matter of fact. And there's no beating around the bush. It is what it is. And I get that because I grew up with that too. Mm. But I also relate to the younger generation because I grew up from that era where I gained empathy from understanding. Yeah. And um, so I'm kind of connecting the dots between the two. And it's a really fun place to be in because as these older generations are thinking about possibly getting rid of their business, I'm you know, hey, this young guy's really got some some potential. I really think that he'd be a good fit to, you know, to help you out. Um, I see that the perspective that I have kind of mends the gap in between the two. And it's a fun place to be. Yeah, I, I, I love 
I get exactly what you're talking about with the drifting because I feel it in the Lego. And it's an interesting concept. And I, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but I, I totally get it because it's this community that doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. And it's not a competition between each other. It's a competition against the rules, the time, the infinite possibilities, the creativity. Your, your competition is the time, the perfect line, the pushing the car as far as you can, as far as the edge. And you're not competing against each other. So you're like in this together. I'm getting goosebumps talking, but you're in this together. And that's the community <laughs> that you want to. And unfortunately, we were talking in the green room earlier just about some other businesses where it's constantly headbutting and you constantly feel like you're fighting other businesses. And the reality is there's the life is too short to do that. And so I, I get that concept so much. And I'm so thankful that you were talking about that because it is those hobbies that allow us as men to truly challenge ourselves in a way that is not degrading to another individual. It's not, I win, you lose. This is how can we all win together? And we exactly. miss a lot of that. You know, we miss, so, um, I don't know, feel free to add anything to that. But I just, once you started talking about that, I'm like, man, I get this because that's what I feel within the Lego world. That's my world. It's like going the Lego world and I can, I can feel the exact same things. It's different, but it's the same, you know? Yeah. So, all right. Lots of stuff that we could talk about, but we're going to have to wind it down. So what, I'll let you choose. What are your habits that you practice? What are the priorities that you have in place what are your boundaries potentially we're not going to be able to cover all of this stuff so what would you prefer where would you like to share uh because we're really looking at how do you craft your narrative and what is most important to you is it setting priorities is it setting boundaries is it uh creating values is it the time is it the uh, you take the reins all the above so <laughs> I would say I should say you take the wheel. That's what I should say. You take the wheel. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say that really habits and routines um, come into play a lot. But with me being the curious George, I've always been, you know, kind of a wanderer. I don't really feel as though I've fit in or belonged anywhere um, as a gap filler. I would find a community and I'd fill a gap for a little while and then, okay, well, you guys have got this. See you later. Mm -hmm. And on to the next one. Um, and after, after growing up that way, joining the military, it was kind of the same thing. I would stay in one service, you know, I would stay at one duty station for a couple of years and then I would go to the next, or we went on deployment for two years straight and we went to, you know, dozen different countries over the course of a couple of years. And I got to explore and see and open my mind to different perspectives. And um, part of being a wanderer is lonely, but part of being a wanderer is also really interesting because you're never done learning. You're never done growing. And there's always something new to learn. Like I've always said, man, if I could be Mike Rowe's replacement, and um, just be a, a fly on a wall behind some new professional every week, that would be the coolest job ever for me because I get to meet new people, I get to see new skills and learn new things, and that's just an opportunity for me to share more information and knowledge with other people. Hmm. Um, because it's what's the point of learning things if you're not gonna share it with other people? Right. Um, so, all right, I squirreled. Where were we going? <laughs> that's okay. Well, I gave you the wheel, so that's okay. You may get drift into whatever you want to drift into. All right, but um, we were really talking about what is it and what is the most important thing in crafting your narrative? Is it your values, the priorities? And you said all of the above, and I get that. But if you were to have to really try to communicate to somebody, this is how I have been crafting my narrative, how would you communicate that to somebody else? So as much as being a, a wanderer as I am, um, I think finding the right community of, you know, men that are willing to support you is, is so important. Um, having people that are there to support you, regardless of, um, what you're going through is, is an important thing. And having vulnerable conversations on a regular basis and pushing each other to be accountable for what um, you know, what you promised yourself and what you promised others. Um, I recently, 
I'm sure you've noticed on Facebook, I've been posting a lot of uh, religious content and, um, you know, being vulnerable about things. I joined a group called uh, The Immortal Man, and it's a 12 week program. Um, and what I've been studying over the last three years as I slowed down was I, it boiled down to faith, family, finance, and fitness. So those are the four things, the four boxes that everything falls into. And when I was kind of at this point where I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm really struggling and I don't know what step to take. I just let go. And I was like, whatever happens next is going to happen next. This guy reached out, uh, Eric reached out and he's like, Hey, wanted to have a conversation with you. Um, it's a faith-based group. So every single week we study different, um, uh, you know, different passages and how they reflect on our life. I go through, I think I'm on week five right now. And, um, over the course of five weeks, by being held accountable in a group with other men, um, and, and the, uh, the atonement for falling short is burpees. So, <laughs> you know, and if you screw the pooch, then everybody else is doing burpees too. So it's not just you suffering, but it's, it's a brotherhood of other men that are, you know, feeling the pain when you fall short too. So everybody's inspired to support each other. And once I made that decision to sign up for this group, it was like a light switch. I was like, man, I've been so busy leading and trying to find a way to do it on my own. And this was presented to me in such a way where all I had to do is just show up. I was like, I, you know, every good leader has to be able to follow too. So I'm going to slow down and I'm going to just let somebody else lead me for a little while while I'm still doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. And it made doing things easy. So I'm up, uh, I'm up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm journaling and I'm reflecting on uh, what I got done, what I didn't get done, how I can ask for help. Um, one of the, there's a whole list of non-negotiables that you have to go through and you have to make one of your own. So mine was having a hard conversation, whether it be asking for help, asking for business, um, setting a boundary. I kind of made it vague so that I could still hit that box on a daily basis. But for me, I avoided having hard conversations. And I knew that in order to be able to grow, I needed to get past the fear of you know, the bite of having an uncomfortable conversation with people. And I found that through doing that, the more often I do it, the more I am able and willing to meet people with love and understanding and the better response I get. So, um, yeah, I would say surround yourself with good people, hold each other accountable, lift each other up. And, um, the more I read the Bible, the more life just makes sense and things flow. I'm not, trying to go in a certain direction things are just happening now mm. so it's it's interesting and it's yeah. fun well it's interesting because you are being purposeful you are doing the hard work but you're allowing the results and this controlling thing that you talked about to step out like you're not you can't control those results you can't control that future but you can control what you're doing now and that's a huge mind shift and i love to be able to see that that's that's incredible yeah what is the one thing that you would want someone to walk away with through part of your conversation, part of your story, people that are listening to you. What's that one thing? Well, there's a few. So, um, <laughs> we can't go past one or two. <laughs> I would say, don't be afraid to ask for help and, um, make sure that you're asking help from the right people. If they're willing to support you, chances are they're the right people. If they're not, set a boundary, walk away, mm. but never quit. You know, there's there's amazing people in the world and you just gotta go find them. And you can't be afraid of being let down because if you walk around with fear, you're never gonna get to where you wanna go because you're not walking, you're just sitting. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Well, th- this has been super interesting, and I, I, I think honestly we could continue to talk because I love doing this part of it, but <laughs> we have to close it down. So how can people get in contact with you? What's the best way for them to reach out if something you said resonated with them and they want to make contact with you to talk about it or to kind of follow up or ask more questions? How can they get in contact with you? Yeah, I'd love to support anybody that has any questions. Uh, You can find me on Facebook. Uh, I think it's Facebook forward slash Tyler Schmoll. Otherwise, if you want to shoot me an email, you can reach me at tjschmoll at gmail.com. You can probably find me on Instagram or LinkedIn. I need to push myself to be more LinkedIn savvy. Uh, (laughs) There's uh, always an area that we can push ourselves a little bit on. Yes. We'll make that one so of your non will... negotiables is to be more savvy. Like, <laughs> like that. I'll ask for help in that department. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for sharing. Um, thank you for the authenticity. Thank you for the transparency that you're sharing. And um, it, 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 I love to be able to see the growth. I, I love being able to watch people as they're continuing on the journey. So thank you for, for sharing with us today. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and all your support along the way. Yeah, so so those that are listening, again, we do post everything on YouTube. We make sure we have that out because, again, nonverbal things that you don't see. Um, the meaning behind some of the words comes out and expresses itself in such powerful ways. So check it out there if you haven't. If you're listening and you missed the emails, we're going to have those in the notes. Make sure you go ahead and check in on the notes to be able to contact people. And I always, always end with this, and I always want to say it. If something touched your heart today, if something transformed you, if something is really making an impact, you're like, man, I got to listen up. We want you to contact us. And the reason is because that's what we're here for. We want to be able to share our lives to help others to be able to encourage and support those. And it really, truly is a is part of a fulfillment for us when you reach out. And I know Tyler's heart's the same way. Uh, so whether you reach out to me or you reach out to Tyler, it doesn't matter. Just reach out to one of us because we want to hear about your stories. We want to hear about how you're growing. So thanks again for listening. And again, got to hit that subscribe button. I always got to put that thing in there. You know, you got to go down and reach in and hit that subscribe button. But until next time, keep crafting your story. You're the only one that can.